In this tutorial, I'm going to give an overview of code repositories for Python. Here we have a code repository. This is the landing page. This home page is actually a readme file with markdown that is formatted. Now, this particular readme file is just the default readme that's created when you bootstrap a repository, but you can customize this. And I encourage you to customize this for repositories that you have in production that are supporting production workflows. You would want some documentation explaining what is going on here, just as you would have with any other readme in any other code repository. If you go on the left-hand side here, it will default to showing you the file hierarchy. And if you click the three dots right here, click expand all, it will expand all the folders and show you all of the files. Now let's take a look at retailtransactions.py. In here, we have a very simple data transformation. We take as input this raw data set that we're pulling in from Snowflake, and we're producing one output data set that I've called retail transactions clean dash PySpark. This decorator at the top, transform DF, is how you indicate to Foundry that the function that follows is a transform. We have a simple Python function. It takes a data set in. It takes some strings, creates a timestamp from them, selects a given set of columns in a particular order, and then returns that data frame. What you should know is that there are different decorators that serve different purposes. For example, this transform DF takes a data set and gives you a data frame, a Spark data frame by default, and is expecting to return a data frame, which it will then take and write to Parquet files in the output data set. There's a lower level decorator called transform, and I believe we have that here in rides.py transform. And that gives you more configurability, lets you do things like write raw files, lets you operate on, say, JSON files, as well as a host of other capabilities. What all of them have in common, though, is letting you specify the inputs and outputs. So at a general level, you can think of these decorators as specifying metadata, if you will, about the transform and your function specifying the actual logic that you want to run. For example, one bit of metadata might be what are the input data sets? And here we are binding the instance of this input class to the variable rides. This input class that we're importing from the transforms API accepts a data set and will allow Foundry to say, okay, I'm going to map that data set over here, wherever it is stored to this transform function here. So we'll always maintain that mapping for you under the hood and we'll pull in the right data, get the most recent transaction, and so on and so forth. Likewise, here we have an output and that will specify, okay, where should the return value from this function be written? If we go back to the rides file, it's a little bit more complicated. We are reading and accessing raw JSON files here. And here we are not returning a value which the decorator will pick up and take and handle for us. Rather, we are taking the rides clean object, which we create here in the decorator. And then we're calling the write data frame method on that, passing into it as an argument, whatever data frame we actually want to write into that data set. Takeaways that different decorators do different things. And my personal preference is I just use transform all the time because it's simply, I only need to know one of these decorators, right? Because it's lower level, I can do everything I need to do with it. But it's perfectly valid to use the transform df decorator if typically you only work with tabular data. That's perfectly fine. One thing that people may want to do is change the name of these folders here. So this one's called datasets. This one's called theme park cleaning. If we quickly make a new code repository, we can see what the default structure looks like. Here on the code repository landing page, let's create a new repository. And we want a pipeline, we want Python, and I'll just call it Taylor's demo repo. We'll save it in the same folder for now. And this will go initialize the repository. As you saw, there were a bunch of other different types of repositories that you could bootstrap. TypeScript functions, Python library, a SQL repository, so on and so forth. Here, it has created a empty repository for us. 
the default folder structure is to have a folder called my project and one called datasets. Datasets is a Python package. You can see that by the init file there, and we have this examples module inside it. Now this is all commented out. It's the boilerplate code for creating a basic transfer. If you uncomment that, well, then you can fill in valid inputs and outputs, and then you can write whatever code you want to write. It's a handy way of writing your first transform. Now, what a lot of people will do is they'll want to rename this folder datasets, or maybe they'll have multiple folders in there, and you'll want to rename this folder my project to something more sensible for whatever you're actually working on. That's going to cause an issue. The reason this will cause an error initially is because of how Foundry scans this repository looking for transforms. And what it does to do that is it relies on this pipeline.py file. In here, it's going to import from my project import datasets, right? It's looking for whatever folder is storing or folders are storing your transforms. Again, you could have multiple folders storing those transforms. Obviously, this is a hard-coded import, and this is going to break if you rename those folders. So we just need to do from this is a better name, import datasets, and then it will be able to discover all the transforms that you have added the decorator to, and then it'll be able to run them. Otherwise, it will have an error. Likewise, in setup.py, you need to specify the root of the project. It's no longer my project. It's now this is a better name and everything will work from that point forward should only be a one-time thing you have to do but if you do want to change the directory structure there you'll need to make sure that pipeline.py and setup.py are correctly configured you can search within files here and you have obviously can replace things the box icon is where you search for and install additional libraries either public ones or ones that you have created on your own for your own organization you can see the current git status right here. We've made a bunch of changes, so they're reflected right here. We could add a commit message and commit our changes if we wanted to. And right here is how you access credentials and other sources for making external network requests from your code repository. So for example, if you were writing some code that needed to make API calls, you would bring in that API from data connection, and then you could access all the necessary endpoints and uh, secrets through this panel right here. The only, only other things to know to get started with code repositories is that you can work locally. I recommend if you're brand new to code repositories in Foundry, use it in the web browser a little bit first before including the repository locally and following the documentation to set up your local work environment. Settings is where you can protect branches, where you can configure Spark profiles, things like that. And of course, branches is where you view all the branches for this repository. Presumably you'll be working on this with other colleagues. Pull requests is where you review other pull requests. And checks is when you make a commit or run a build, you may see CI CD checks running for this repository. This is where you see the status while they're running as well as after they're completed. One other thing to know about is Let's go back to the this repository right here where we already have written code, is that you can preview the code. So building will run the full transform over the full data set. In this case, we're using Spark, so it will have a Spark application with a certain number of executors, and then it will run the full build. However, you can also preview it, which will run a subset of data in an interactive manner. One option is to click preview, just like I did, and it will run this as a, over a preview of the data. This is good for development purposes to a little bit of code, preview it, make sure the results look like what you want them to look like, and so on and so forth. I'm going to stop this preview though, because I want to show you something even more useful for development purposes, which is you can add breakpoints just as you would with many other IDEs. So now if I add that breakpoint, Preview and Debug will step through the breakpoints I've set in my code, allowing me to examine whatever variables exist at that point in the code. And I can even preview the data frame at that point in the context of this debugger. Very helpful for iterating your code in code repositories. That's it for this intro to code repositories. 
Let us know if you have any questions and we'll see you in the next tutorial.